parts 173. Uh, we learned about CSS so far, um, about how it describes how a document is written um, <clears throat> and how it is formatted, um, how it gives you layout and font choices and color choices and things like that. Um, CSS has evolved over time from CSS1 to CSS2. CSS2 is the current standard and um, on to CSS3, which is still the official party line is that it's in development and not standardized yet. Um, so we're going to be kind of dealing with features that are, um, what are the words I'm looking for, kind of, they're, they're pretty consistent across browsers, but just not the what is accepted as the universal standard by um, the World Wide Web Consortium. Like I said, they're the people who decide this stuff. So, <clears throat> but all that said and done, um, I feel perfectly comfortable teaching CSS3 and you can kind of figure things out as you go professionally. And this is something that's really cool and really worth learning. Something that your employers are gonna be interested in, I think. So, um, CSS3 is the later, latest standard for CSS and we're going to learn about some of the features in CSS3. So the things that are cool about CSS3 is that it lets you do a lot of stuff that was previously only doable with images, um, such as rendering text and um, certain things that you can do with borders like rounded corners and drop shadows and things like that. Um, simple things that um, like I said previously, you had to render an image and insert that into your web page to get those effects. So it's kind of nice to have <clears throat> um, something more efficient now. It also gives you a greater level of control, which is nice. Um, we are going to use a couple of CSS3 generators and those are online. I'm going to go to css3generator.com. Mine's already partially open. And I'm going to start here. There's there's going to be another one that I'm going to use in a minute, but for now this will do. And all I have to do is open the page and go back to CSS, uh, go back to uh, Dreamweaver. Um, and under Unit 6 in my tutorials folder I'm looking at a folder called behaviors in CSS3 and here's a file called css3.html um, these other two I don't know what they are or where they came from they're just junk files and you can actually just delete those okay I'm gonna open css3.html and basically this is just a series of elements that we can kind of play with and apply some CSS3 with our generators. Now um, in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy some code and I'm going to paste this in split view. So let me set this up first. I'm on live view. I need to change that to design. And what I want to do is I want to go to my CSS designer and I want to add a new CSS file, just the same as before. And we can just use these helper panels to get us started. Um, that's not a problem. You can actually define quite a bit of stuff before you even start adding the CSS3 if you want, if you're more comfortable doing it that way. Um, a lot of people will be. So I'm going to call this css3fun.css that in and I'm going to browse to my um, unit 6 and we're going to behaviors in CSS3 is that right? maybe that's wrong I'm going to no that that's what I'm looking for I think okay and I'm going to save that as css3fun.css okay they're giving me a weird file extension okay whatever so I'm gonna click OK yeah that's what I expected to see alright so I've got a, a linked CSS um, document 
as per the normal. And I'm just going to add a few selectors. Um, I'm going to create a style for the body. This again, this is just kind of the overall general style. And I'm just going to set a few text properties. Um, I'm going to give it a text color of uh, very dark charcoal brown, I guess. And um, I did that kind of quick. This just gave me an RGBA color. And this is actually our first um, CSS3 property is this RGBA color. And there's one in the generator as well. And this is one that we won't need to use anymore. We can just use Dreamweaver CC's RGBA color picker, and that'll be fine. The RGBA just means it's a color model that's described with red, green, and blue, and then the A stands for alpha. So in other words, you're picking a color that allows partial transparency. And that's pretty neat for background colors especially. Um, if you've got a background over a, over a, a body image, for example, then you know, partially transparent can look pretty classy if done right. So I'm just going to go with a dark charcoal brown for my text. And I'll full justify it just for fun. You can see it updating here. Um, font family, let's go with Gil Sands just for fun. These choices, if you haven't figured out yet, are pretty arbitrary. But again, the body tag, this is a good opportunity to review. If I'm styling the body tag, it um, applies those styles to everything on the page. So let's add another selector now. And I'm going to make a property for the wrapper ID, and I need to put a hashtag in front of that. We knew that. We learned that already. Um, and the wrapper, as always, uh, needs a left and right margin. I'm going to turn on show set so I can get to the custom properties more easily. Um, let's give it a margin left of auto, margin right of auto, and I'm going to give it a width of, I don't know, we'll make it 800 pixels. Okay, so there you go. Um, and we'll give it a couple more properties. I know I'm going to be putting some colors on this, so it'll need some padding. I will give it a padding of 25 pixels. And I will give it, it's going to need some more space on the top. I'm going to give it a margin top of 25 pixels. Let's give it a border. One pixel solid black. All right, that ought to do it. Now you can add all of your properties in this manner and get a lot of your CSS design done as we have already learned how to do it. Um, but then when you get to the CSS3, um, by the way, I'm going to level with you. There's, there's a few CSS3 commands at least that I've already seen in the um, in these helpers, and I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with using them, but I would like you to take a look at code view, and I know that there's a little bit more level of control that we can get to that um, will make things pretty interesting. So these are the CSS3 properties. Um, I'll just start with box radius for the first example. I'll give the div wrapper a box radius. Um, that just rounds the corners. I was mentioning that earlier. This one's definitely in the Dreamweaver helpers. I've, I've noticed that. But um, I will set this in the CSS3 generator. Um, I will just set the first one. And it's going to give me an all-around radius of 40. So that, so that uh, each of the corners is 40 pixels radius. And I can click copy to copy that to my clipboard. 
Um, this is going to give me two CSS properties in this case. In other cases, it's going to give me more. Um, and maybe a few cases it'll give me less. But this is the, uh, the WebKit browser feature um, where it's just uh, pref they preface this with the prefix WebKit. And all that really does is just targets the WebKit browser. And this is the universal command where it will just eventually be called border radius. Some of these they're going to target more than just the WebKit browser too, like um, Safari and uh, Internet Explorer and blah blah blah. So we're just going to copy and paste it and we don't need to worry about that. All we do need to worry about is that um, you want to make sure that each rule in code view is encased in a pair of matching curly braces. So you can see here's the closing curly brace and here's the opening curly brace. And what you want to do is when you paste these in you just um, you want to put your cursor probably at the end of the last rule and just press enter once and press paste. Um, it doesn't matter really what order it's in but if you interrupt a rule you're gonna break things. Um, the, the other thing you need to remember is that semicolons are the new periods when you're looking at your CSS file. So every statement ends with a semicolon. You'll see that throughout and we're gonna type some stuff in too and I'm gonna I'm gonna really um, hopefully drive these points home. Okay, so first thing you'll probably notice is that this does not show up. And that happens with Dreamweaver Design View, at least as recently as uh, Creative Cloud 2014.1, the CSS3 is not going to show up in Design View. If you switch it to Live View, it will. However, um, Live View editing can be a little bit funky. So, I'm going to switch it back to Design View. For the most part, I'm going to stick with Design and edit that way, but I do want to preview it in Google Chrome. We'll do this kind of the traditional way, and yes, you can save everything, Dreamweaver, and we'll take a look at this in the browser. Again, just to reiterate, the browser preview is always your gold standard. Okay, so this is just our very first CSS3 um, property. It's a rounded corner, so let's get into some more of these. I'm going to go back to the CSS3 generator right here and I am going to let's usually I just kind of picks the pick these arbitrarily. Let's go to a box shadow and I'm going to say no inset. I'm going to give my rounded radius div a box shadow. A horizontal vertical length of one pixel, blur radius of one pixel, spread of zero pixels. Just a small little drop shadow the hex color will be zero 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 so and you can see the drop shadow show up here there's two kinds there's a box shadow and there's a text shadow um, the text shadow actually applies a shadow to each letter of text that you use and we'll use that in a while but right now I've got this box shadow that I'm gonna it's just a subtle little block uh, black shadow so I'll copy that to the clipboard and I'm going to paste that to my wrapper rule. Again, I just can put my cursor at the end of that last rule and press enter and I've got my box shadow pasted in. Now here's a, here's a pretty common workflow with uh, traditional web design is what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a save all and I'm going to switch over to the web browser I'm going to actually look at my document and I'm going to press refresh. And now I can see when that updates, it's now displaying that CSS3 command. Um, that's a pretty uh, standard kind of workflow for, for this sort of work. Making a few updates in text, flipping over to the browser and pressing refresh. 
Okay, so that's that's probably kind of enough explanation. I'll just start uh, going through these just to give you a look at them. Let's take a look at text shadow. Basically the same thing as uh, box shadow, but it's a um, obviously just a drop shadow put on your text. <clears throat> and these are your options for it. I, you don't have to, again, use the values that I'm using. They're just arbitrary. But, um, oops, didn't mean to do that. There we go. So there's your text shadow command. Again, just copy it. And um, I'm going to give a text shadow to the H1 tag. And I'm actually going to add this in code view this time. Um, and to add a tag, you just type the tag just like that. And then I'm going to do the open curly brace. And then you want to press enter twice and do the close curly brace right away. Just type that closing curly brace before even putting anything in it. And then move your cursor back up and then paste your your command in. I'm putting in tabs too, by the way. Um, the copy and paste doesn't necessarily do that to make sure everything like lines up and is easy to read. So I know that each of these properties are inside this pair of curly braces right here for the wrapper. Um, it's just a visual way of organizing things that you um, will be able to read your code better. So <clears throat> it's something also that Dreamweaver um, previous versions were terrible about, um, especially with HTML. The HTML in previous versions of Dreamweaver did not look like this. This is much cleaner, which is I'm happy about. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, so I added the H1 rule that just covers the H1 tag. And there's my text shadow. I'm going to give it a color as well. Remember the color property is that actually the text color property. I'm going to give it kind of a mid gray. And uh, sometimes you have to refresh this view and the F5 key will refresh the view. So that's my H1. And like I said, that CSS3 property doesn't show up very well. So flip back to your browser and just press the refresh button. I'm, I'm using shortcut keys now, by the way. I mean, you can just click on your dock or um, your, your menu bar on Windows, and that's fine. I'm using Command Tab, which is the same thing as Alt Tab on Windows. So it just flips you through the different um, applications that are running. Um, that has nothing to do with Dreamweaver, but that's what I'm doing. And then Command R or F5 on a PC will refresh your page uh, in the browser. So <clears throat> anyway, that's that's what's going on. And we've got, like I said, a drop shadow now and that gray color. Um, I'm going to give the H2 tag. I'm going to give that a color as well. Oops. I give it kind of a dark blue color. That works. And if you're getting concerned because you don't see this show up right away, when you're doing this in code view, um, the design view doesn't always refresh right away. Just press F5 to refresh it. Um, let's actually, I would like to go back to that H1 and do a couple more things. Yeah, I'm going to give it a text align of center and I'm going to give it a bottom border. Um, one pixel solid. I think I'll make it black. Just I'm just kind of going simple on this, so no big deal. Um, oops. I was going to say that border should be showing up. I, I typed the wrong thing. It's not bottom border. It's border bottom. There we go. <laughs> okay, and I set a color for my H2. Um, I just leave it at that for now. That's all I'm going to do with it at the moment. Um, so that's the. So we looked at the text shadow, and like I said, the RGBA, we can just use Dreamweaver's color pickers. Um, this is something that we're going to cover in a minute. This is true type fonts, and we'll talk about how to do that. I'm not going to use the generator for that either. either. Um, so multiple columns would be next, and this is an interesting little 
and I've still got that drop shadow. I don't like that drop shadow. I'm going to try refreshing and see if that gets rid of that drop shadow. Yeah, it did. Good. Okay, so um, I can give myself like two columns and um, define the gutter right here, which is kind of nice. And this just takes one block and makes all the text in it fit into two columns. It doesn't matter if it's headers, paragraph text, whatever, bulleted lists. It's going to put it into two columns. So um, use this wisely. If you, if you don't know, um, I, I would almost say if you haven't taken Arts 175 yet, maybe just skip this. But, you know, just basically use good judgment. You generally don't want, like, the big headers and the big callouts to be forced into columns. Um, but H2 and all the way down to body copy probably can be. But there's good, there's reasons to exclude certain things from columns. Anyway, um, let's just copy that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another div because <clears throat> I don't want this um, header to be forced into columns or the header nav or the upper navigation here. But everything after that I would like to be put into columns. So I'm going to create an ID. Um, it doesn't matter what order these appear in. A lot of times I like to actually kind of group mine together though. I like to have tags together and IDs together. Dreamweaver won't do that. It's just going to put it in there whatever order you made it in. So I'm going to actually, it, you don't necessarily have to do this, but it's a good organizational practice. I'm going to cut the wrapper. I'm going to use Command X cut the wrapper rule and put it at the bottom with command V. That was just a cut and paste. And I'm going to make another ID. This one actually hasn't been done yet and I'm just going to call it content columns. Open curly brace, close curly brace as always. And I think I lost what was in my clipboard from that because I pressed cut so I got to go back to Chrome and press copy again. So now I can paste that in. And let's just tab those in so everything's lined up. <clears throat> and I'll save it. I'll flip over to the browser and refresh my page. And nothing has happened because I haven't actually made the div that has that um, identifier applied to it yet. So we got to actually take all this stuff from this point down to this point and wrap it in a div called content columns. So that's pretty easy to do. I'm just going to go back to my source code and you can actually just put your cursor right before that first div right here. That's this one. It, and it might be easier for you to select this visually and then look at your code view. So that's one thing that's nice about Dreamweaver is you can put your cursor where you want it to be. Like I know I want to start with this element um, and I know I don't want to select it this way because the teacher told me that was a bad idea. So you can just put your cursor there, come down here in code view and you know exactly where you are. So that div should start right here and I need to give it an ID of content columns and when I type that ID equals double quote all of my IDs pop up right away, so that's kind of nice. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm going to put that content columns, I'm going to start that up here. Now this has to be closed too, and basically this is going to close right before your wrapper div closes. So if it's easier again to select that visually, just scroll down here and put your cursor right at the end here where it says it's too tedious. And then from there, I can see there's the close of my there's the close of my paragraph text. This is the close of the div containing this information, and then the next slash div is the close of the wrapper div. So it needs to go between those two. <clears throat> understanding that comes with understanding nesting and what elements are a parent of other elements and what elements are a child of other elements. Um, that's the kind of thing that um, it comes with experience in doing your homework and your readings. So I'll refresh that. Actually, I'll go back to Google Chrome and refresh it. Now I actually have the columns. And this could use a little bit of margin underneath it. Um, 
because this is just a tad crowded. But <clears throat> like I said, I did not want this first part to be in columns because that's not really what you want to do with your main callouts or, or anything that's like super important or separate from everything else um, probably should be separated visually as well. So <clears throat> you'll learn a lot of that in 175. So um, I'll stop with the 175 lesson and let Susie take it away from there. Okay, so let's go back to actually, let's go back to the CSS3 generator and <clears throat> Let's talk about a couple of these others. We don't necessarily need to do all of them. Um, let's see, box sizing. Yeah, we're not going to worry about those. Um, outline, I don't think we're going to worry about. I mean, you're welcome to play with these on your own, but I just I just need to show a couple more. I'm going to show transition, and I'm going to show transform and gradient. And we're probably, let's start with transform. Um, <clears throat> a transform is... Uh, as you can see, you can scale, rotate, translate, and skew. Translate means move, uh, like some degree on an x and y axis. You have to remember that x and y axis. You got x left is left to right, and y is up and down. The top left corner of your design is x and y zero and zero, but it's going to use the top left corner of whatever its parent parent element is. Um, so for example, uh, let's make a little div box next to the words, um, let's see, up, I know where I want to put it, why use CSS3. Um, we'll put it right before this p tag. And let's create a div with the ID of new and improved. You might have noticed, by the way, you can add these IDs um, to the element before it exists as a CSS rule. And you can also add the CSS rule before that idea has been applied to an element. It doesn't matter which direction you do it in. They, they're both legit. So, And then I'm going to close that tag right away. When you, um, Depending on your settings, when you type the um, greater than, or sorry, less than slash, that'll close your tag right away. And that needs to be tabbed in to display the nesting. And actually, everything from this content columns down to the close of the content columns needs to be tabbed in one level as well. Again, to visually um, display that nesting. And that's a big selection. You gotta start right after content columns with div ID equals div one. And you gotta go all the way down to the bottom. And it's you're gonna select all the way down to, it's line 82 for me, but it might not be for you. Um, the slash div that is the, f the first in the series of three before that closing body tag. And that's basically everything that needs to be nested in. The browser doesn't care about this. Um, this is just for us, what we're doing. And it helps us to look at things and make sense out of them. The other thing um, that I might not do, but I'm going to show... This also helps you navigate your code once things start to get um, like this, which is what you can expect, pretty much. Um, you can take selections in Dreamweaver, and you'll notice the highlighting over here on the side, and there are these two little arrows. You can actually take the selections and collapse them, just to kind of take pieces of it out of the picture, and that really helps visually a lot more than, um, you, you might be surprised how much that helps. And it, it just really helps you make sense out of things. So, for example, if I, um, and I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but this is worth talking about. The um, <clears throat> If I take what everything that's in the Div 2, this is not the close of the Div 2, by the way. This is the close of New and Improved. This is what this is kind of illustrating, what I'm showing here. Um, if I take everything from the Div ID New and Improved down to its close, I can collapse that it becomes a little, suddenly it becomes a little more obvious. Like if I take the P tag inside the new and improved and collapse that, it's like, oh, okay, that's the close, that's the opening of that div and that's the closing of that div. This is a type of thing that you might have to do to troubleshoot your HTML. And it really, really helps if things are tabbed and nested properly. It helps you understand. Um, this 
code is all still here. It's not, um, it hasn't like been deleted or anything. But I can leave it collapsed, or I can just, um, I can either click on this little triangle here, or I can just double click it to uncollapse it. So you're going to at least need to collapse that middle one. So, and another thing that Dreamweaver CC does, um, I don't, I don't remember Creative Suite doing this, is that when you click on a uh, tag, it'll actually highlight the opening and closing tag. So that's another way that it's showing you the nesting parent-child relationship. So that will hopefully help you understand visually. If I click on this one, the closing tag will be all the way down here. I can tell you before I get down there which one it's going to be. It's going to be the second one in the series of three. So. I know that from experience, but that's the kind of thing that you want to make sure you understand. So, anyway, that was a big tangent, but it was worth talking about. Um, let's go back to that new and improved div we were going to make. And I'll give this, uh, I'll give it an H3. It gives me an opportunity to use the H3. And I'll close that tag right away. Move my cursor up and just type the words new you know what let's use an ampersand watch this new and improved well what happens if you put an ampersand in your in your code oh okay it gives you the actual ampersand I didn't think it was going to do that um, it's a special character and uh, Dreamweaver just made me a liar but it's a special character and it should actually be done through the insert menu under character there's is the ampersand on here by default it's not okay so let's go to other and I'm just gonna type insert rather than try to find it and click OK well what the heck Dreamweaver alright I'm just gonna type it it's ampersand AMP semicolon apparently Dreamweaver's too good for this anymore, but <laughs> at any rate, um, ampersand is a special character, and um, there's a bunch of others. Um, there's uh, curly quotes. Um, there's the greater than, less than. You can do a copyright. You can do an and copy. That's a copyright. Um, just under the insert menu you can find quite a few characters copyright registered trademark pound yen euro and uh, and then there's a lot more under the others these are called glyphs and um, they can be useful for your typography so if you want to use them they're in there so do a quick save all just so I've done it so I've got this word new and improved next to my YUCSS3 and I want this to be um, sort of a, uh, a call out and I'm just gonna for fun I'm gonna kind of knock it out and rotate it I'm gonna create my actual rule now I just I switched over to my CSS3 again remember this is the source code is the HTML this the CSS3 is linked it's right next to it um, so new and improved open curly brace close curly brace and let's just uh, let's start with a width of I'm gonna try 250 pixels and that might be a little big let's try 150 pixels and let's give it a text align of center um, Let's give it a background color. And I don't know, make it kind of a medium lightish green color. Semi transparent, why not? Let's do a semi transparent, just bring the alpha down a little bit. And make sure that semicolon is there. Sometimes the helper adds the semicolon. And sometimes it doesn't. Uh, let's give it <clears throat> a border one pixel solid black and I'm gonna go to my um, take a look in my browser here okay so there's 
there's a little box that says new and improved. Um, I want it to kind of be removed from the flow and not push the other elements around. So I'm going to give it a position of relative. Let's just make sure I've got the right position on there. <clears throat> I think so. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to give it a z-index of 2, which should put it on top of everything else. Top of negative 20 pixels and a left of 50 pixels. I'm going to try that. I've got an idea of where I want it to go. but Okay, so more to the right and more up. Let's try top of negative 50 and the left of 100. Yep. Okay, and let's bring that bottom up a little bit. Let's get that margin bottom. Um, I'm going to try negative 50 pixels to compensate for that move up. I think that's what I want. Yeah, that looks about right. Now move it a little more to the right. This is kind of normal. Um, I probably could have planned this better, but it's it's pretty normal to kind of flip back and forth between your CSS and the browser refreshing. That's um, probably, I don't know, I spent a lot of professional hours doing basically this. <laughs> um, so it's a big part of it. Um, let's try a left of, let's try a left of 200 pixels just to make sure this does what we want it to. Okay. And now let's go back to the CSS3 generator and do a transform. Um, sometimes this gets weird if you don't put values in each one. I'm not sure um, if it'll, oops, if it'll take it or not, but I'm, I'm just going to type it in just um, on, I'm going to type something in on each of these. So for scale, I'm going to type in one, which means just we're not going to change the scale. A rotation though. We're going to give it a rotation of let's say 30 degrees. Um, even 30 might be a little high. Let's try 25. And we're not going to translate it. We're going to give it um, and we're not going to skew it either. Well, you know, here's a skew just so you can see it. It does some interesting stuff. So, but we're just going to make it a zero degree skew. I just want a uh, scale of run, 1, a rotate of 25 degrees, and everything else can be set to 0. It might take it without typing anything in here, but I'm never sure, so I just type it in. Okay, and let's get these last four lines and tab them in. Um, just to reiterate, these are the different browsers that uh, are being that this is being rendered for. And then this last one, the one that says transform, this is like the base rule for whenever these go away, um, whenever that is, then it'll just use this one. And these won't be really doing any harm. So if you were to deploy something, then you know this would be fine the way it is. Just make sure you got all your bases covered if you're gonna be using CSS3. So let's save that and refresh it. And that's kind of what I wanted. It's a little ghetto, but <laughs> it's about what I wanted, just to make the point. So there's um, there's the rotation, or the transformation, in other words. And the others are transition and gradient. And what I, what's going to happen is when I, click, when I click on gradient, it's going to say, you can find a nice gradient generator here, which is going to send me to colorzilla.com slash gradient editor or you can just type in colorzilla.com slash gradient editor either way um, but this is my ultimate CSS C, uh, gradient generator it's pretty um, uh, ultimate I guess so um, there's a bunch of default gradients in here um, we're designers we don't use defaults we do things ourselves so um, we know how to or, or should I as far as I know know how to operate this gradient editor. It's, the ba it's basically a um, mimicking the Adobe gradient editor. You've got your stops and you can set your colors and opacities for those stops. I'm going to 
just use a two-stop gradient, one at the beginning and one at the end. It's pretty simple. So um, just make a simple gradient here. I'll go with yeah, I'll go with a blue color scheme. Why not? So you know, I lied. I'm going to make a three-stop gradient. So I've got a stop in the middle and the the last stop. I'm going to let it get a little lighter. There we go. Okay. And over here, you can give it an orientation of diagonal, vertical, whatever. I'm going to stick to diagonal. And then down here is your code, and this is just a little confusing. I don't know if you can see it there, but the, the copy only appears when you actually hover over it to copy that to your clipboard. So that sometimes confuses people a little bit. But um, And if you want to change your color format to RGBA, you, you can do that. Um, hex will be fine, though, usually. So everything here looks good. Um, I'm just going to click Copy and you'll get this huge, huge bit of um, text. I'm going to put this on the body. Now, again, as we know, the body cascades down into every other thing on the page because everything on the page is a child of the body. So when we put this in, and same thing, we need to tab those lines in. And really, if you want to be um, anal about it, you could delete these extra line returns too. But at any rate, um, so being on the body, this is going to make the whole page inherit that background color. And most of the elements on the page right now are um, transparent, and this one's partially transparent. So we're going to see that background color show up everywhere. In fact, our, our links are kind of disappearing because of the color choice on our links, but um, we're going to take care of that. So that's a gradient. Um, I'm going to do another one. Let's do another gradient. Um, I always like to start with a preset, and um, from there I like to just uh, work with it and, and usually turn it into whatever I want it to be. So, um, I don't know, we'll go with, oh, we'll just go simple. We'll keep it simple again. Um, oh, and I usually, I, I like to change this selector right here to the hue because I like the I like the hue saturation model better than I like this model where I'm picking the hue on this side and the brightness and then I'm picking the saturation on this side. This is what Adobe's pops up as what Photoshop's pops up as this by default usually. So so it's just what I'm used to. It's what I always go with. Um, so I don't go somewhere in the yellow range and just I'm going to get a really unsaturated kind of tan that's even a little bit olive I want to make it just a little bit more ivory and I'll add a second color there there we go just kind of an ivory almost like a like an ivory paper whatever and if you want to just for fun we'll change the direction and I want it to be, I think I want it to be brighter at the top. I'm going to flip that. I'm going to reverse it so that it's brighter at the top. Okay, so now, now I can copy this. This one is going to go in the wrapper. So it'll be kind of overlaying that other gradient. And you can very easily overdo this. This can become bad design real quick. So, um, I almost wouldn't even use two gradients on one page, but my second gradient was very, very subtle, so it's not too bad. Hopefully, we'll see. So yeah, that's not too bad. It's, um, you know, you can get gaudy with this, so try to hold yourself back. <laughs> but those are the gradients, and Next up is the transition, and I'm just going to real quick add some rules for my tags, uh, for, for my uh, link tags. And like I said, I like to keep things grouped together, so wherever my tags end and my IDs begin, I'm going to put it after that. So I'm going to go H2, 
And what I like to do, I'm going to do my A rule, that's the link tag, open, close, curly brace, just like always. Now, but A almost always comes with those four pseudo classes, link, visit, hover, active. And I would like to just get you into the habit of typing all those out right away. A link, A visited, open, close, curly brace, A hover, open, close, curly brace, A active, open, close, curly brace. And by the way, you can use these um, pseudo classes on any element. It doesn't have to be a link. Okay, so for the overall A property, um, all of the A tags globally on the page uh, will inherit this property. I'm just going to give it a few, again, just basic things. Um, let's make it, I don't know, I'll make it kind of a grayish tan color. I'm going to give it a drop shadow and instead of going back to my I'm going to text shadow specifically I'm going to give it a text shadow and I'm just going to copy and paste it from the H1 rule right up there instead of going back to the gradient gener or I'm sorry the CSS3 generator because you know just to save some time and let's see give it a font family of whatever just pick one <laughs> keep it simple here I'm also going to give it, um, let's give it a border, one pixel, solid, black. Um, let's give it a padding. And the A tag, now the padding is going to add space within each of these A elements. So <clears throat> they're inline. So I'm going to give it a padding of five pixels and I'm going to give it a background color. No, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm going to give it a background color of, um, and let's just pick our color. I'll make it kind of a bluish, mid-bluish, whatever. Okay, and let's flip back to the browser and take a look at that. Yeah, and that's kind of getting close to what I want. So, um, just to get something to look at just again arbitrary values and I would like the rounded borders so I'm going to create a border radius that's another thing actually by the way that can that can be done in the um, right in the CSS panels here under the border right down here here's your border radius I'm gonna set it to I don't know five pixels there we go I still want you, um, I like students to do it this way because it helps you learn about code view, um, it helps you learn about CSS code, and it gives you a more uh, finite level of control than what Dreamweaver does by default. Um, and in addition to that, um, this is probably helpful for the students who are trying to use tools other than Dreamweaver because this is what you got to work with. You got to figure this stuff out by. Um, trial and error doing it manually so the uh, link property is sort of the dormant state and the visited property these are the styles that uh, refer to after you've clicked on a link hover refers to when you're pointing your mouse at a link whatever styles you set there you'll see those when you when the user points their mouse at a link active refers to the duration of time that the user has is clicking so they, while they've got that mouse click down, they'll see the styles that you set in the active um, pseudo class. The hover pseudo class, by the way, does not appear in touch devices because there's no such thing in a touch device. So keep that in mind when you're designing your web pages. That's becoming obviously a bigger and bigger deal all the time. So as far as the dormant state goes, I'm, I'm not going to touch that right away, but uh, we're going to have to set that in a minute. Let's go to hover, and I'm going to do something that you might find a little strange. I'm going to increase the padding. I'm going to increase it to 10 pixels. Actually, no, I take that back. Let's delete that. Um, let's do a let's do a CSS transformation. Let's go back to the CSS3 generator, 
and I'm going to go to a transform and let's set it to scale to 1.5 and no rotation no translation no skew but I'm going to scale it to 1.5 this is like multiplied by 1.5 so one and a half times the original size if you want to give a percentage to it just add a zero so 150 percent the original size 0.8 that would be 80 percent the original size so <clears throat> There's a lot of values in CSS that work like that, as well as other design programs where it gives you a scale of 0 to 1, and that represents 0 to 100%. So copy, and we'll go back to our hover state, and I'm going <clears> to <throat> paste that transformation. Let's get it tabbed in. Okay, so I've got that pasted into my hover state here, the transformation with the scale. And I'm going to go back to Chrome. I'm going to refresh this. And what's going to happen is we're going to wonder why it's not scaling up because we're pointing at it. And we should see when we point at the object, it should scale up. <clears throat> so you're probably wondering why isn't it doing that? The reason is because the scale only works on block level elements. And A by default is an inline element, which means the elements will appear in a line. Again, they're treated as um, characters, and they appear in a line instead of a new um, and a new line each one. So uh, we can change that. Any of these that we want to change. If we want to change the a tag to a block level element, we can just use the display command and say display block. Um, but I actually don't want that because I, I still want them to appear left to right, but I want them to behave like block level elements. So when you want that you actually want inline block. <clears throat> now if I save that and flip back to the re browser and refresh you'll see that they actually size up. Now I'm gonna do one more command um, actually I take that back two more commands. I'm gonna go back to the CSS generator and this part is the part that might seem a little weird but um, as long as we're still here, I'm going to change that scale back to 1. So now I've got like a complete reset. Like these are all defaults. It's like I didn't use this command at all. Scale of 100%, 0 degree rotation, no translation, no skew. I actually want to copy that and I want to paste that into my dormant state where it just says A colon link. Let's paste that in there. And the reason is because um, it'll reset to that by default, but I just want to define it explicitly so that the next part works. And uh, the next part, we'll go back to Google Chrome, to the um, generator, and we'll go to a transition now. Um, and it will transition a few different properties, usually uh, nine times out of ten, especially for newbies, the easiest property is all. So it'll just transition all the CSS properties. Um, a good duration just depends, like in this context, probably half a second, maybe a, maybe one second at the very most, just to kind of emphasize how much it plays. But you shouldn't be pointing at stuff and having it take like 10 seconds to show the, um, you know, the fact that you can click on it. Like you can see this transition right here happens, I don't know, maybe in about a half a second or so. So I'll, I'll set that to one second. Um, function, we'll just set that to ease. <clears throat> and there's our transition. Usually that ease function will work just fine. That just defines how the um, how the transition starts and stops. Does it accelerate and decelerate? Or does it just kind of start at the speed that it's going to go and stop dead at the end of its cycle? So usually ease is a good choice. So I've copied that. I'm going to go back to my CSS and I'm going to I'm going to paste that into both the link state as well as the hover state. It has to be in both. So that when you point at it, it will show you the animation and when you point away from it, it will animate back to its dormant state properties. So it's all this is animating is a change in scale right now and we can change that but just to show the animation happen so there I saved it and refreshed it over here 
and this is kind of what it looks like. When you point at it, you get a one second animation of the um, of the link expanding and contracting. So it's kind of cute. Um, I don't think a transition of um, size is really the best choice in this context. I think it's a really good choice in, in some contexts, but probably not this one. Maybe um, a background color would be a better choice. So maybe I'll define a background color for the hover state. And let me just see if I can, I don't know, kind of a yellow maybe. Kind of a saturated bright yellow. There we go. And add that semicolon at the end. And the link state, I'm going to copy the background color from the from the overall A tag and just paste it in there again. And then when I go back, I'll refresh it. And I've still got a one second transition. Um, now just doing the background color. And you can do both at the same time. You can do changes in border. Basic, most style changes are supported. So um, give it a try and just kind of play around with that. Definitely looks pretty good. So moving on, let's go to, let's see, what do we want to do next? I think we've done everything we need to do with the CSS3 generator and the gradient generator, so we can close those. Uh, let's take a look at Google Fonts now. This is a really, really cool development in web typography, and you can finally shed that list of web safe fonts that I'm sure you're all sick of. And this is the first of two ways that you could do that. So let's go to google.com slash fonts. This is probably my favorite. I, I prefer this over the true type font uploading, but we'll take a look at that in a minute. So this is Google Fonts, and basically they got lots and lots of fonts to choose from. Um, I'll let you search through it, but if I filter out, for example, um, I just want to look at the display fonts so that I can grab a couple of fonts for my headers, and we can get something cool going. Let's. Uh, Let's see here. So I don't know, just uh, basically pick one and, and roll with it. There we go. I'm going to go with unkempt. And the easiest way probably is to click on quick use. And we'll just do that. And I'm going to grab the bold. Actually, I don't think I even need the normal. Um, if you don't, because I'm doing this for the headers. So if you don't need all the styles that they have to offer, it's better if you uncheck the ones that you don't want. So that kind of takes down your, your load time. So just like it says right here, don't use a bunch of font styles that, you know, you're not going to, don't select a bunch of font styles you're not going to use. Okay, so character set, you don't usually need to do anything with this. Then we need to add this code to it says website, which is a little vague. They actually, you actually want to add this to your um, HTML file. So all you have to do is, again, um, just highlight this, copy it to the clipboard. We'll actually have to press copy this time, so Command C, Control C on a PC. And then now we just flip over to the source code over here once again, and I need to go up to the header section, or I'm sorry, the head section. Header, not header, but the, the head tag, so the metadata. And this can just go anywhere inside that head tag. It doesn't matter where, just as long as it's in that section. So I just put it on the next line after head, which will be fine. OK, so save that. And then we're going to copy this next line and go back to our CSS. And basically, this is going to let us use the font. So I'll change the H1 to my font family unkempt. And it still has that backup, that backup cursive in there. <clears throat> this means any cursive font on the computer, by the way. So um, just in case they don't actually support 
Google fonts. So all modern, all modern browsers do, though. And I'm going to put that on H2 as well. And that's it. That's all that needs to happen. Let's do a save all. Um, again, it's not going to show up in design view. Um, this actually has to go out on the internet to make this font happen. When we refresh this, it's going to go to Google and grab this font. And then it'll send it over the, the pipes. So that is method number one, probably my favorite of the two, of getting some new fonts in your page. So let's take a look at the other way. Okay, and just one last little bit here. Um, just uh, another way to add a different font to your web page um, using uh, typically true type fonts. Also available are open type fonts. <clears throat> um, so we can grab a font from our favorite font site like defont.com, that's where I am right now, or 1001 fonts or whatever. And um, I'm going to change my body copy. I'm going to use this one. I'm kind of digging the Baybest new whatever it's called. Also it's 100% free so that's nice. Um, and I'm just going to download that font and all I have to do is unzip it and go to my downloads folder and unzip it. So and this should be this is basically the same thing if you're um, on a PC except that um, well you've already figured out how to unzip by now because you've you've got this folder so anyway I'm gonna we did end up with an OTF apparently uh, you might not have but I'm gonna copy that to my behaviors and CSS3 folder or move it whatever um, just for simplicity uh, you might want to use a subfolder called fonts or something like that um, and once that's in there I can go back to my Dreamweaver and um, edit my CSS to include uh, this thing called at font face. This is how you incorporate true type fonts is with that at font face command and then of course the open curly brace, close curly brace as always. I'm starting that at the top because that's a particular type of selector sort of like this one that it comes with, the character set. Um, you, know, you don't really have to deal with what that means, I just like I said like to group them together. Um, and we're going to say font family, but this time we're not picking a font family. We're actually going to name this thing. And I'm just going to call it body. Actually, I better call it body copy just because there's something already called body. And I'll type in SRC for source, and then I'll type colon. And then I can just link to that um, font file. Just double click this thing that says URL dot 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 and then it'll open up your select file and if you're um, you might uh, be in a different fo uh, folder you can always click site root jump back to the site root and go back to unit 6 behaviors in CSS3 and this is where we copied that font so I can select that Baybass new OTF and click open and it gives me that URL interestingly it's written without quotes and uh, in the example it uses it uses quotes but I've tested this it works either way but of course I always add that semicolon okay and for the P tag now we've got a font called body copy so I can now use that as though it were a font so I can type instead of Cambria or whatever I can just type body copy just the way it has to be the same way I typed it up here and you still want that backup so you want to type comma sans serif or if you're using a serif font then obviously you would choose any serif font as the backup copy and we'll do a save all and when we go back to our CSS3 and refresh um, we've got a different kind of body copy now this is now using an open type font to render this text and it's live text which is kind of cool so um, there you go I would actually might have even changed this font as well but um, I think that's enough I think that gets the point across that for all the tools that you need for this assignment um, so give those tools a try and I, I really do 
um, take that design phase seriously. I really I want you to put in the um, I want you to put in the brainstorming time and and do some planning. I want you to put in the planning time, and I want to see your planning. That means you need to post it, and I want you to share it with your classmates and talk about it. Um, I don't like students turning in their site and then saying, oh my goodness, I lost plan I lost points on the planning phase and then going back and doing their planning phase because it really kind of makes it feel like pointless busy work to do it that way. And I don't want this to, I don't want to give you the impression that this is pointless busy work. It'll help your design out quite a bit. So that's it.